as he mentioned, my name is Misha Sra, and today I'm going to talk about something that most all of us are using right now, and I don't mean your phones. I'm going to talk about your ears. So in 1790, Alessandro Volta, he had just invented the battery, and he put the electrodes in his ears and then promptly passed out. And right before he passed out, he said he felt the sensations of spinning. And most likely that sensation was from vestibular stimulation, which is what I'm going to talk about over the next several minutes. Right before I get into it, let's take a moment to think about balance. Balance is something most of us take for granted, right? Most of us can easily walk across a gravel path. We can transition from walking on a sidewalk onto grass back onto the sidewalk. And we don't really have to think about it. People don't normally stumble doing those things. Now, maintaining balance requires that the brain receive information from three main sources. You need information from your visual system, so data coming in from the eyes. You need information from your proprioceptive system, which is your muscles and your joints. And as an example of proprioception, some of you want to follow along, or all of you, if you hold out your fingers just like that in front of your face, close your eyes, and touch the tip of your nose with your finger and eyes closed. And most everybody can do that with some amount of success, right? And that's because of your sense of proprioception, this inner sense that we have. So the third thing the brain needs is information from your vestibular system or your inner ear. So what exactly is going on inside your ear? Turns out a whole lot. The sensory information about motion, about equilibrium, about spatial orientation, all of this information goes from your vestibular system to your brain. And in each ear, you have what constitutes the vestibular system, which is what I just highlighted with that rectangle. It's three semicircular canals that are at right angles to one another, and they take care of detecting rotational movement. And then you have the utricle and the saccule. Those take care of detecting gravity as well as linear movement. It's kind of like the gyroscope and the accelerometer working in your phone. It's the same kind of system, and it's a pretty amazing system. So the semicircular canals are filled with a fluid called the endolymph, and at the base of each canal is a copula and some hair bundles inside it. So if you look on the right side of the image, when the person rotates, the fluid gets sloshed around, and when the fluid moves, the hair moves, and then the hair sends a signal to the brain telling what's happening, right? And then there's three semicircular canals. There's essentially the anterior canal, which detects motion like this, like head nodding. There's posterior canal, which detects motion like a head tilt towards your shoulders. And then there's the lateral canal that detects motion like a swivel, your head going side to side. The utricle and the saccule, they work slightly differently. They have tiny calcium carbonate crystals, kind of like tiny bones, that are floating on top of the gel membrane, inside of which there's, again, hair bundles. And so when you look at the person bending over to pick up a box, the bones get pulled down because of gravity. And they pull the gel membrane along, and then the hair gets pulled along. And again, the hair sends a signal to the brain saying, all right, this is what's happening. So the utricle largely sits horizontally in your head. And that's how it detects movement in this plane, things like moving forward, side to side. The saccule sits vertically in your head. And so it detects movement in the vertical plane, things like sitting down or standing up. When all of this works, people can do some really amazing things with balance, right? But what happens when things don't work right? What happens if the signals that are going to the brain just don't line up? Well, that's when you get motion sickness, right? So motion sickness essentially is a mismatch of signals that are sent to the brain from your eyes and your ears. And I imagine a lot of people have experienced this here. When you're reading a book in a moving car, your ears are telling the brain, 
I'm moving. But your eyes are telling the brain, nope, we're not moving, because you're essentially static relative to the car seat, the floor beneath your feet. And so it's this disagreement between those two signals that triggers nausea and vomiting, right? The same thing happens in virtual reality. Like VR, as it exists right now, essentially depends on visual information. And so the possibilities of what we can see in VR, practically endless. However, what we can feel in VR is very limited, right? Most of the time, you just feel like you're standing in your living room or sitting on your couch, even though you may be flying or swimming or doing all sorts of things in VR. Now, what if we could make you feel this motion? What if we could fix motion sickness? That's exactly what we did when we built a vestibular stimulation device. It basically is a small wearable that can automatically sense when to provide you the right type of feedback when you're in VR. The way it works is that we place electrodes behind each ear and then we hook up the device to a small battery and then we stimulate the nerves that I talked about earlier, the nerves that go from your inner ear to your brain. We stimulate them with a small amount of current, something like maybe one milliamp. So electrically stimulating the vestibular system is called galvanic vestibular stimulation, or GVS. We tested our device, we tested GVS in a VR roller coaster experience. You can imagine what a VR roller coaster might feel like. Um, and in this case, it went from a vomit fest to something that people actually found thrilling and exciting. People were like, I want this in my home. I want to do it all the time. And they said that they could feel every turn of the roller coaster in their body, something that they'd expect to feel on a real roller coaster. Another thing we can do in VR, which is what I started to talk about, is remote control people. Basically, how can we steer people using GVS? And if you watch in the video, the person actually intends to walk straight, but they end up turning quite smoothly. And that happens, well, there's a prerequisite for it, that you need to be looking down when you do apply GVS. So if they had been looking up and we had applied GVS, they would have staggered. And that almost feels like somebody's pushing you. That doesn't feel comfortable. But this is fairly comfortable. You just turn towards the anodal direction quite smoothly. So we use this idea in building a two-person VR game, kind of like an escape the room VR game, where there's one person who's in VR, and they're in a dark room. They can't see anything, but they can hear things around them. And then the other person is using a tablet or a PC. And they, their task is to use GVS to steer the person in VR around obstacles, help them escape the room, right? So it's a collaborative game. So this is all well and good. It's all fun and it's pretty interesting. But what else can GVS do, right? Volta didn't stick electrodes in his ears just for the sake of doing so. What he wanted to do was see how stimulating the ear could be done electrically. He wanted to see how it would impact hearing. Similarly, other researchers in the 1800s, um, they also tried using vestibular stimulation to see if it would fix deafness or if it would cure other diseases of the ear. Now, doctors are starting to use vestibular stimulation for things like therapy, rehab, even for training, athletic training enhancement. Scientists are starting to use GVS, trying to see how really low levels of stimulation can actually impact higher order brain function. Things like tactile sensation, um, face recognition, and even memory. Right, so as a last thought, we all know that machines are getting smarter by the day. Right? And what if we could evolve alongside the machines? Now, brain hacking has been a futuristic fascination for decades.
But we all understand that actually fully understanding the brain is going to take many, many years of work. But with GVS, we can actually get started right now by building devices that can impact small parts of the brain, hack those little areas, just like the one we created. Thank you very much.